have the pleasure today of introducing our lunchtime discussion. And really, these two gentlemen need no introduction whatsoever. Um, but I did want to make a couple of remarks before we welcome them to the stage. We have today Leader Mitch McConnell, who has served in the U.S. Senate since 1985 and has since then ri risen to the ranks of our Senate Majority Leader. Uh, no stranger to you all. You know what a champion he is for Kentucky, uh, what a champion he is for fighting substance use disorder. And in his position, Kentucky really has been able to punch above our weight in many, many areas. He has been a true friend to not only the Kentucky business community, but the Kentucky Chamber. I was just telling him in the last year when all the various pieces of federal legislation were coming down, his staff would call us almost daily to make sure we were okay with what was ever in the legislation, what Kentucky businesses needed, what we are hearing. And we truly do thank him for that line of communication and really that true support of Kentucky businesses, especially in the last year during probably the hardest time any of us have ever lived through. He really is a testament of fighting for Kentucky businesses in D.C. Um, he has been uh, obviously married for many years to secret former Secretary of Labor Elaine Chow. She also served as Secretary of Transportation under this last administration. And in a couple weeks, I have the honor of interviewing her at our first ever Women's Summit. So I joked with him, maybe he could help me out with a couple of questions later on. And today, we have done this before, where Leader McConnell has been interviewed by our good friend Scott Jennings. And it's always a hit, and people always leave wanting more. We could probably listen to them for hours. Um, but you guys know Scott Jennings. He's no stranger to the chamber. He is a very dear friend to the chamber and the business community. He is co-founder of Run Switch Communications. You probably also see him several times a week on CNN. It's always fun to see Scott um, on CNN when you tune in to listen to the, the, the daily politics. And starting out several years ago, he was also in the Bush White House. He really is one of the top political strategists in the nation. And any Anything that goes on political wise in Kentucky, I'm pretty sure Scott usually has a handle on all of it. So we want to thank them for joining us today. We're going to have a great conversation um, about 30 minutes and then go on to the next part of the agenda. So please help me in welcoming Leader Mitch McConnell and Scott Jennings. Thank you, uh, Ashley and uh, Beth and the chamber for having us here today. Um, and Senator, Scott. thank you for um, being with us today for this uh, important topic. This conference, uh, as you know, is addressing uh, addiction and recovery in the workplace, um, the overall impact on Kentucky's workforce and how uh, the business community should respond generally to the opioid crisis in the state. Uh, you've obviously done a lot of policy work in this area, a lot of legislative work in this area, uh, and you've been instrumental uh, in a number of issues which I want to touch on. Uh, the first, uh, maybe a bit of breaking news for some folks here, but um, you've helped secure a number of HIDA designations for counties in Kentucky, the high intensity drug trafficking area designation, which means a lot to a county that gets it. The latest one was Davis County in, in Western Kentucky. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more for this crowd on the importance of these designations for our counties that get them. Yeah, well, <clears throat> this is um, mostly a law enforcement activity. I don't know how many of you on, are on the law enforcement side as opposed to the addiction and recovery side, but <clears throat> it basically involves high level of coordination between federal, state, and local authorities and additional funds uh, for the law enforcement effort, high intensity drug trafficking areas. I've had actually down here the last three drug czars going back to the Obama administration. <clears throat> we worked pretty hard to get enough counties in Kentucky to where about half of the population is in a Haida area. Um, we were lucky enough this current year to be one of six designations in the whole went to Davis County this year. So um, it's a highly successful coordinated effort uh, to deal with the law enforcement challenges. And, uh, I, I think it's made a difference and I'm sure that uh, some of the people in the room have had 
indirectly some kind of benefit from that as well. Yeah. On the other side of the policy equation, of course, is, is helping people get their lives back uh, as they recover from addiction, um, especially in the areas of housing and workforce development. I want to personally thank you on behalf of this crowd for three bipartisan bills that you helped lead the charge on. The first was uh, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, CARA, the 21st Century Cures Act, and the Support for Patients and Community Act. Uh, you were instrumental in writing those bills and passing them through the, the Congress. I was wondering, though, as we think about that legislation, if you could talk about some of your personal interactions or visits that you've made. Uh, for instance, our conference today is sponsored by the Isaiah House. I know you've made a number of, of these kinds of visits to places like that and met a lot of people. I was wondering if you might want to reflect on any of that and maybe talk about how that influences your policy making decisions in Washington. Yeah, well, those bills that you mentioned, I was the majority leader at, at that particular time. By the way, it's better to be the majority leader than not to be the majority <laughs> leader. <laughs> and um, we were looking for ideas from the experts and Mark LaPalm and Mike Cox uh, were some of the first uh, people we interacted with to get ideas about how to how to craft the legislation. Jennifer Hancock, the Volunteers of America over, mm -hmm. she's headquartered in Louisville, but interestingly enough, it's just opened in Clay County, mm -hmm. a totally different kind of county from Jefferson. Um, her focus is on pregnant women and addiction recovery problems related to, to childbirth. And then up in Northern Kentucky, the Life Learning Center, uh, Alicia Webb Edgington, that some of you know, they're basically focusing on getting them back to work, getting people, it's not, it's not enough to be in recovery unless you can uh, have a job to, to, to go to. And uh, so we tried to interact with all of them in crafting the legislation. So we had the best advice we could get in putting these bills together. Do you get the feeling that your colleagues in the U.S. Senate are doing the same thing, sort of viewing these issues now, not just from purely a law enforcement issue, but also recovery, getting back to work? You know, you've been in the Senate a long time. Do you get the feeling that, that your colleagues are, are understanding the multifaceted issues involved in recovery and getting your life back? Absolutely. Just to give you an example, <clears throat> you know, it's not uncommon for senators to run for president. You've heard that. Um, Do you have anything you want to tell us today? <laughs> no, not <Okay>. me. <laughs> uh, but, I, you know, and people would traipse up to uh, New Hampshire, which is the first, the first uh, primary in 2016. And I would discuss what, you know, what the issues were in New Hampshire. And oddly enough, the top of the list was the opioid crisis in New Hampshire in the presidential election. That ought to underscore the pervasive nature of the problem. And of course, unfortunately, we seem to have it worse than, than most, uh, or at least we're among the worst, which is something we're all trying to fix. But um, I, yeah, I think, and also I think the notion that this is not primarily a, a law enforcement issue, although there are some really bad actors uh, bringing in horrible things. But getting people's lives back together is the recovery part of this is, uh, I think all of my members now fully understand that's, that's the big problem. On that topic of, of getting lives back together, there was a part of the Support Act that passed that included a provision that you wrote called the Career Act, which provides funding to treatment centers, uh, places like St. Elizabeth's Healthcare and Mountain Comprehensive Care Center, they got grants to the tune of $1 million, I think. And so I wanted to just ask about sort of that kind of direct help and your views on this. In light of the fact that we are facing widespread labor shortages that may be hindering our economy's ability to recover coming out of the pandemic, I was wondering if you see any linkage between uh, helping people recover and get back to the workforce as a possible solution to some of the labor issues that we're facing. I'm sure you've, you've met a number of businesses lately that are telling you the same thing. We can't find workers. Well, I mean, <laughs> the governor and I have been in a little back and forth over this very issue. Um, <clears throat> I think 
we have gone um, too far to make it too difficult uh, to get people back to work. And um, in the, um, the recovery package that passed, the, the rescue package that passed this year after the new administration came in, <clears throat> we have basically developed some pretty significant differences of opinion about the way to deal with the 100 year pandemic when the 100 year pandemic is on the way to being over. And one of the things that led members of my party not to vote for the most recent package, even though last year everything passed almost unanimously, this year it hasn't. And the reason for that, I think, is pretty clearly a difference of opinion about where we are in the pandemic. One of the examples of something that I think was a mistake was continuing the $300 federal plus up per week. <clears throat> and I just came from a group of uh, small business uh, people before I came here, been meeting with people in all kinds of businesses, uh, including people who are in the recovery business. And um, getting people back to work is a horrendous problem. So 25 states said to the Fed, to the federal government, keep your 300 bucks. And interestingly enough, in most of those states, the number of applications has gone up dramatically. I was on a conference call last week with uh, some people from our state who also run businesses in Indiana. And they said, <clears throat> as soon as the governor of Indiana said, no, thank you to additional 300. They had 200 job applications the next day. Hmm. So I don't know how many of you all have had trouble getting people back to work, but we got we to gotta do that. And we've certainly known all along it was important for people who were, in, who were addicted and who were in treatment to have a job to go to. But there are others who aren't, who need to get back to work. And we need to make sure that in our country, work itself is still valued. Uh, you can make it so lucrative not to go to work that you end up literally propping up an, an enormous number of the population. So we've had some, some differences of opinion <clears throat> about just how long to continue uh, these massive uh, bills. But the subject of, of our discussion today, um, I think there continues to be pretty broad bipartisan support for bills like CARA, like the 21st Century Cures Bill, which by the way was passed in the last year of President Obama's administration when I was the majority leader of the Senate. We worked together on putting together the 21st Century Cures Bill. The president had a particular interest in one aspect. The vice president was interested in the cancer moonshot because he lost his son, Bo. I was interested in precision medicine. So there were, there were a lot of coming together. And it was in many ways the most significant bipartisan legislation we passed in the last two years of the Obama administration. And a, a lot of that money also went into the subject that we're talking about today. Well, let me, let me transition to that because your record of delivering federal appropriations is well known uh, to people in this room, but specifically on the opioid epidemic, the top line report is, since you've been in the Senate focusing on this issue, $3.7 billion has been spent in some of these bills to combat the opioid epidemic. 280 million of that has come back to Kentucky to fight substance abuse. Some of that money went to the University of Kentucky. 87, Sharon, from UK, $87 million, the largest, grant in UK history, right? Yes. On, on this subject. And Sharon and I were just talking about the phase that you're in now with what, 20 some odd counties? 16. Yeah. My question is this, with all this money being spent and your personal history and your personal narrative as being a victim of polio as a child, from then to now, you understand well the issue of American innovation in treatment for all kinds of things. You helped the Trump administration uh, with Operation Warp Speed, which delivered a vaccine for COVID in 
record time. And until that vaccine, it take, it, you know, it's always taken many, many years to develop treatments and, and cures. And I've just been wondering if that experience that we had last year, your personal experience, the money we're spending, you know, are we reimagining right now federal involvement in the development of cures? Do you think that we may be entering a phase in our country where we may be doing things faster than, than we used to do as we try to innovate research and cures for this and other scourges in our society? Oh, absolutely. Um, because of my own experience with polio, I've read a good bit about it. In fact, I just finished a book about the history of the disease and the conquering of it in this country. It took 70 years, 70, to develop two effective vaccines that finally brought polio to its knees. Our country last year, as a result of the bipartisan legislation that we passed during the pandemic in the CARES Act, which I'm proud to say actually began in my office as a majority leader and we built it out and trying to tackle both the healthcare crisis and the economic crisis simultaneously. Part of that was what we called Operation Warp Speed which in conjunction with our incredibly effective pharmaceutical industry in this country de developed, as all of you now know, not one, not two, three highly effective vaccines in less than one year. A stunning modern medical miracle. And the 21st Century Cures Act was all about a lot more than just the, the opioid or, or the addiction problem. It was about a major plus up of NIH for the pursuit of these breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. uh, healthcare, um, we're, we're on the cusp here of, of extraordinary uh, success in a whole variety of different uh, diseases. And um, it's a pretty exciting time to be alive. And as a result of it, we're all living a lot longer and the older it gets, the better I like that. <laughs> Uh, from the uh, beginning of the pandemic, I think um, you, among others in Washington, correctly recognized the consequences that uh, would come to our economy uh, and in our personal lives because of the shutdowns and, and how specifically this might affect people who were in recovery when the pandemic started. And so between two relief bills, you secured $40 million for Kentucky to address mental health and substance abuse issues specifically related to the pandemic. And so my question on that topic is, as we come out of the pandemic, do you foresee more federal funding in this area? Because I think a lot of us believe that the ripple effects of the shutdowns that we went through will be felt for years. Uh, I personally think we just lived through the biggest mental health crisis in our nation's history. But I think for people in recovery, this was even worse, and, and, and the effects of that could be felt for a long time. Do you think this is something the federal government will stay on top of as we sort of put COVID in the rearview mirror, but understanding that people will be dealing with it for years to come? Well, part of it we will. The other part of it we have wound up. How many of you took advantage of a PPP loan last year? I know you did. Uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the, the PPP loan program was designed to allow you guys to continue to offer these services during the pandemic. Over 70,000 small businesses in Kentucky and people who do what you do, and many of you are a small business, access these PPP loans, which kept the doors open. But that's wrapped up now. The PPP program is wrapped up, but what you're talking about, Scott, needs to continue. And I do think this whole addiction and recovery effort enjoys really broad bipartisan support in the Congress. You know, we have a lot of fights over things that we disagree on. <clears throat> this is not one of them. Well, thank you for your comments on uh, the opioid crisis, your work on that. Uh, before we left the crowd today, I thought it'd be remiss if we didn't discuss some news of the day. And speaking of things that we may be having fights about, I thought I would turn our attention to infrastructure. And uh, uh, the news out of Washington, D.C. last week was that 
there might have been a deal on infrastructure. And then <clears throat> President Biden said some things that threw that into question. And then other things were said over the weekend. And so as we sit here in Lexington today, I was wondering if you could just give us an update on where you think things stand on infrastructure package, reconciliation, and, and, uh, and all that that's been in the news over the last few days. <clears throat> okay. Well, if, if, <laughs> if you look at last year, the CARES Act was the biggest bill, but we passed some other bills. We spent about $5 trillion we added to the national debt. We did it almost overwhelmingly on a bipartisan basis because we're in a 100-year pandemic an emergency, an extraordinary situation. As we turn the corner this year, we had these three vaccines beginning to go into everybody's arms. And on the vaccine issue, if you're a football fan, I think we're in the red zone, the last 20 yards before you go into the end zone, but we're not in the end zone yet in trying to convince people to go on and get vaccinated. So we're still working on that. But as we went into the new year, Scott, the reason you saw the bipartisanship disappear was because this was no longer 2020. And the new administration wanted to spend $2 trillion more, and they did. And that was on a purely partisan basis because I and members of my party felt it was wildly beyond what the country needed at this particular time, although some of you may benefit from it. But out, out of that $2 trillion, only 1% was about vaccines and only 9% was about healthcare and the rest of it was about a whole lot of other things for which you may benefit. But already as a result of what we did on a bipartisan basis last year, we have a debt the size of our economy for the first time since World War II. We're beginning to play Russian roulette with the future of our country. And so we think these massive spending bills have gone far enough. Looking at what, they would, what the administration would like to spend this year, or at least authorize, up to five trillion more, the two trillion that's already approved in the pipeline for the rescue package, and a massive additional amount of money adding up to seven trillion in one year, which would be roughly what we spent to win World War II in one year. That's why this is not bipartisan. <clears throat> but a portion of it, Scott, infrastructure could be bipartisan. And you've watched <clears throat> discussion between 10 of my members and 10 Democrats who've been working together to try to figure out a way where we can spend about $1 trillion, not a total of seven, but one, credibly paid for. The gas tax produces about this much. And that we collected and sent it down to the states. To the extent you want to go above that, what I've said and what most of my members have said, let's credibly pay for it so we don't have to add it to the deficit. And whatever we can agree to, try to go forward. <laughs> what got all balled up is the administration would like to do a whole lot more than that. So the president last week had a walked out with the 20 members, 10 of mine, 10 of the Democrats, announced we had a bipartisan deal, and then two months later said, but I won't sign it unless I get the other bill. In other words, way more. So where, where we are now is we're in kind of a stare down about whether one is connected to the other. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to see us do, what I know the 20 members, including 10 Democrats in the Senate would like to do is to pass the thing we can agree on. And then we'll have a, a debate and an argument and a vote over all the rest. So that's where we are. I'm not quite sure how this is gonna play out. But the larger question is, just how much debt are we prepared to saddle the country with for the future? And what strikes me is our dear friends on the other side just don't want to stop. Like the pandemic just keeps on going. We can't 
do this without, as I said, playing Russian roulette with our country. So we're not in a <clears throat> totally bipartisan place now, but we are trying to find places where we do agree. And we've actually passed seven, seven major bipartisan agreements in the Senate this year. I bet none of you know it because anytime we agree to do something important, it makes no news. And only when we're disagreeing does it create any headlines. So I want to tell you the Senate's not broken. We don't hate each other. We do a lot of things together, but they must teach them in journalism school that only bad news is news. So only when, <laughs> you know, only when we are, and, and the debates that we have are over legitimate differences. You shouldn't be surprised to know that in a country of 330 million people, everybody doesn't agree. We don't, that's why there are two parties. We look at things differently, but it doesn't mean that we aren't trying to to get outcomes. The American people are divided. We have a 50-50 Senate. Doesn't get any closer than that. And a two or three seat majority for the Democrats in the House. So our view is these guys didn't get a mandate to do all this that the American people thought maybe neither side got a mandate and maybe we ought to look for things we can agree on to do. And I think that's where we are. And, and speaking of um, driving bipartisan agreement um, one of the rules in Washington that tends to do that, at least in the Senate, is the filibuster rule. Uh, I think Kentucky may be the most educated state in the nation on Senate procedure because of your longevity as leader <laughs> of the Republican conference. But this is, gets a lot of news, and uh, uh, some media folks on Capitol Hill uh, tend to harass the same two or three Democrats every day about the filibuster. Any update for us here in Kentucky about whether you think the rules of the Senate will change or whether they will hold? Well, I never <laughs> predicted in my career that a Senate rule called the filibuster would become so well known <laughs> in, in America. <clears throat> so let me just take you back just a little way. George, a little way, George Washington, <laughs> who presided over the Constitutional Convention was asked, what do you think the Senate's gonna be like? He said, well, he thought it was gonna be like the saucer under the teacup, the tea was gonna slosh out of the cup down to the saucer and cool off. So the founders of our marvelous country always had in mind the Senate would not be a place that things were done quickly. <clears throat> and until 1917, there was no way to stop a debate at all, at all. Starting in 1917, there was a procedure put in place called cloture, where a majority of the Senate could actually bring something to, to a conclusion. <clears throat> so legislation in the Senate almost all of it requires more than one side, usually, unless one side has a really big majority. Uh, President Obama in 2009 and 2010 had a really big majority. He had 60 votes in the Senate. He could do whatever he wanted to, and he did. But most of the time, <clears throat> most of the time, neither side has that degree of dominance, which makes one of two things happen. Either the bill doesn't pass at all, or you reach a bipartisan consensus. Now, if any of you are political junkies, you may remember the previous president, the one who recently went out of office, was haranguing me all the time about getting rid of the filibuster. Mm. He tweeted about it. I have some it. recollection of his tweets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a one what answer, no. <laughs> Even though I had a majority at the time and it might have benefited us. I didn't think it was good for the institution. And during that period, about half of the Democratic senators signed a letter saying that filibuster was the essence of the Senate. And now we're down to two, <clears throat> which underscores the old saying that where you stand depends on where you sit. In other words, the numbers have changed. And so now I have a different point of view than I did last year. So fortunately, there are at least two Democratic senators who believe the institution should not be fractured for a majority of either party to take a short-term advantage. Why that's important is a lot of bad ideas don't go anywhere. And that's not unimportant that bad ideas don't go some anywhere. That's what the founders had in mind, that it, the two bodies would be significantly different. 
There is a way around that called budget reconciliation, where one party, if it has a majority, can pass something. You can't do anything through that. That's how the rescue plan was passed earlier this year. And they would like to do one more. They're entitled to do one more. There's some guardrails around that. You can't stuff everything into it. And that's the process they hope to use once again <clears throat> for this very, very large uh, package that I'm relatively confident none of my members will support. So it would have to be done on a party line uh, basis. So sorry for all the inside baseball, but that's, that's basically where we are. I think the legislative filibuster is secure. Unfortunately, only two Democrats left seem to really support it. One more policy question, uh, followed by one very, very quick lightning round question. Um, the crime rate. It seems to me that the rising crime rates around the country uh, in Louisville, your hometown, many people here from Louisville, but in cities all across the country, this has become a front and center issue. Even in the New York City Democratic primary for mayor this week, one of the top three issues was crime. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the crime rate. Do you feel like the Congress is going to need to engage on this, or is this principally going to be a state and local driven set of solutions? Well, certainly the unrest in the streets last year brought about uh, a national feeling that the federal government needed to pass a police reform bill. And the emphasis at that particular point was on police abuses. Uh, that discussion has been going on for quite a while. And um, in the meantime, as you suggest, the flip side of the so-called defund the police argument is that the crime rate is going up dramatically. And I thought the reference you made to the New York City uh, Democratic primary for mayor is interesting. Uh, in fact, the so-called law and order candidate, the one who's concerned about the rising crime rate, may have won the election. They have a unique way to count votes in New York now <laughs> called ranked choice voting, where you pick your first choice, your second choice. And I don't know how many other choices you get to make. But at least in the first round, <clears throat> the um, the former police officer who's one of the borough presidents um, had a pretty substantial lead by emphasizing the rising uh, crime rate. So I've watched in the course of my career, the crime issue kind of wax and wane. And last year it looked like the public was more concerned about police misconduct this year, they're not unconcerned about police misconduct, but also questioning whether reducing funding for law enforcement makes sense in the, in the wake of rising uh, crime. Before we go, um, you're stranded on a desert island and you can only have one companion. Your choices are Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, or Jimmy Carter. Who do you choose? a tough choice. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't choose Jimmy Carter. Uh, we can rule him out. Well, he might actually be able to build a shelter for you, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I take your point. Go on. <laughs> uh, I like President Obama. The only thing I didn't like about him is he had a tendency to tell me to my face what I thought. And one time I had to say, now, Mr. President, really, that's not what I think. Now, what were my other choices? <laughs> President Biden, former President Clinton. Yeah, well, I, I would pick Biden. Uh, Biden and I did uh, four bipartisan deals together during the, uh, during the Obama administration. I consider him a, a personal friend. I was the only Republican that went to his son Bo's funeral. So that would be an easy choice. I think Biden's a first-rate person. Uh, to, to show you how popular he was in the Senate, <clears throat> he was invited <clears throat> to do the Republican eulogy at Strom Thurmond's funeral and at Jesse Helms' funeral. And I did the Republican 
eulogy at Jesse Helms' funeral. And so I can attest Joe was very, very popular. What he was not, what he was not was a moderate. <laughs> and so he, he is uh, certainly <clears throat> bold and ambitious and fully in line with Bernie Sanders' view of what America ought to look like. And that's why we're having big arguments that you will witness all year about just how much uh, we need to spend and borrow and tax. Senator McConnell, on behalf of the chamber and this conference, thank you for your work on opioid issues, addiction, recovery, and for your time today.